Hey guys, Chris, Stratomatic Delaware. Thought I would do a how to play payoff pitch video, and here it is. And uh, we've got our examples on the table. Um, when you purchase the game, you get, if you can uh, pre order an imprint uh, printed game set when the cards already come printed. <clears throat> everything's already cut for you, it's ready to go, or you can purchase the PDF, print it out on, like I did, some good sturdy 110 card stock, and hand cut the cards all to yourself. Um, they don't have to be perfect, you know, cut them, just cut them, you know, you're playing the game, <clears throat> so it doesn't really matter how perfect they are, and hopefully this frog won't be a problem for the whole video. But all you need are those, um... Two D6s and two D10s, a percentile will help, or else have a different color so that way you know what you are using for your 10s and your 1s digit. Uh, it comes with minimal charts, which we will go over in this video as well. It comes with a rule book. Comes with the cards for each team, batters and pitchers cards. It also comes with a group of pitcher hitting cards. And uh, we'll show you how to determine which one to use. Also fatigued pitchers cards, and we'll tell you when to use these. And also ballpark cards, stadium cards. So let's, uh, let's go through this. We're going to be reading the instruction booklet. And we'll start on page two. <clears throat> How do you read the cards? Well, when you roll the dice, like so, you read the two D6s and you start with the pitcher's card. Then, depending on what result you get here, you go to that section and on the batter's card. Now, these are color-coded. If you print them on a color printer, I'm sorry, mine, I don't have access to a good color printer, so these are black and white. They serve my purposes. But um, each of these correspond to a section on the batter's card. And um, verse lefty, verse righty, uh, 89, you see if the result is in there. <coughs> well, let's do this one. Six is tough. And Mickey Lolich is left-handed. So you go to the tough section of Gene Richards' card, verse lefties. Now you'll see that 89 is not in the range. You've got 1 to 34 strikeout. Uh, 1 to uh, 35 is a double. 36 to 46 is a single. So since 89 is above anything in that range, you go to the out section, and 89 is a ground ball to second base. And that's how you do the results off the cards. 90% of them, that's all you have to do to resolve every single at bat. And it starts with a pitcher. He pitches it to the batter. <clears throat> it's got a good flow. It's got a good feel to it. Um, on the pitcher's cards, you will find uh, what hand they bat, uh, pitch with and their age. Um, the hand that they use to bat, what side they bat from. So he's a left-handed batter. And you use the number one pitching card. So just like with these cards for the batters, the pitchers are assigned a specific hitting card depending on what their skills are. And they range from 1 to 16. So 1 is the least. So Lolich was not a good batter. Um, sacrifice bunt rating, D. <clears throat> A is the best, down to, I believe, uh, A, B, C, D, and F. They don't use E for any of these ratings because E refers to error. So they don't want to confuse anybody. So it's A, B, C, D, and F when they're using alpha, uh, alphabetical abbreviations for ratings. Fielding, this number corresponds to his range, A, B, C, D, and F. So if it's a range check for the pitcher, it's a C. If it's an error check, you would look at three. That is his error check. Uh, fatigue, um, he can go five innings before he may become fatigued. If he comes in in a relief role, he is long relief. There are long relief and short relief pitchers. We'll cover that. His hold rating is six. It's used for one of the base stealing options. Um, injury... His is normal, but it will tell you one of the three injury ratings, and if there is an injury, there is a chart to determine the injury. 
uh, double play rating, wild pitch rating. If there is an uh, extra strikeout rating, it will be listed here, and then stats at the bottom to see how they performed. Um, pretty much the same with the batters. Uh, Left-handed batter, 26 years old. Uh, what team they played for, that's on here as well. <clears throat> um, positions, center field and left field. And then you have the range right here. Um, you have the error rating, which is right here. This is whether it's going to be a hit or an out if they get to it. This is if it's going to be an out or an error if they mess it up. And uh, outfielders and catchers have an arm rating. Infielders do not. Pitchers do not. Comes to advancing extra bases and stealing bases. Um, it gives their injury, uh, their double play rating. We'll show you how to determine double plays as well. Uh, steal rating, uh, 4 and B. B is um, his actual steal rating. 4, I believe, is his jump or his lead. And then base running, 7. Um, sacrifice rating, bunt is B, again, A, B, A, B, C, D, and F, and A is the best, F is the worst, um, gives you stolen bases, caught, sacrifice hits, and stats, and, uh, this is pretty much duplicated over here on the pitcher hitting card, and the fatigued pitching card pretty much duplicates what you've got over here, only wheelhouse, and patient seem to be better for batters. You'll notice wheelhouse and patient on a fatigued pitcher's card is lumped to the center. He'll have a much greater potential to roll a favorable result to the batter once he is fatigued. Um, and then you have the ballpark cards. Um, and we'll show you how to use these as well. So that pretty much takes us through two and three. Um, injury ratings, well, nah, we'll get to that. I'm not going to worry about it. It's in the instruction book. We're covering what's on these cards just to give you an idea of how to use it. Um, after you selected the two teams in the home team's ballpark chart and filled in the lineups on a score sheet, now it's time to play ball. It's important to note about the dice. They may be rolled all at once, or you may choose to roll the d6s first and then the percentile roll. Um, do 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 do. For we're just going to roll all four dice at the same time. That's the way I play it. Uh, let's see. First, we'll roll the dice, and let's say that the two d6 yield a roll of five. So we look on Mickey Lolich's card. And 5 is in play. And let us say that the percentile roll is 89. Well, you look at left-handed batter versus left-handed pitcher. Sorry. In play, 89 is outside of the range. That would be a ground ball to second base. However, if it was, say, 19... Then you would look for the range where 19 is, 5 to 24, so that would be a single by Gene Richards. Let's say instead of 5, we have rolled a 6. Now we're looking at tough. Now you look versus left-handed pitcher. Mickey Lolich is a lefty. Um, tough. 19 would be 1 through 34, so that's a strikeout for Gene Richards. However, if that roll was, say, a 39, 36 through 46 in tough is a single. However, if it was 79, 79 is not in the range in the tough section. You go down to the outs. Fly ball to center field. That's how you do that. Um, card abbreviations are on page five. They pretty much make sense to anybody who's been playing tabletop games or scoring baseball for any amount of time, so it's, it's easy to get. <clears throat> um, page six, the dice. As mentioned earlier, the two D6 are added together to obtain a result two through twelve. The percentile dice are read zero zero through nine nine, with one die representing the tens digit and the other representing the ones. Percentile makes it easy. 
I, I have a lot of percentiles. I got a lot of dice because I do a lot of RPG with friends on the weekends as well. So I've just got a lot of dice. Um, you can use two of these as long as you know which color is going to represent the tens and which is going to represent the ones. When zero, zero is rolled, like so, when zero, zero is rolled on the percentile dice and the two D10s they refer to as the percentile dice, a rare play has occurred. Consult the rare play chart instead of the pitcher's card. So let's say we roll this six and a zero, zero. You don't go to tough. You go straight to the rare play chart and remember we rolled a six here is the rare play chart if bases are empty batter hits ground ball to short stop and pulls up lame trying to beat the throw to first check for injury this is where you check for injury so you roll your percentile if he's prone this is the injury chart uh, table you look at if it's a normal injury like Gene Richards is normal, like Mickey Lolich is normal, then you consult the normal column. If he's durable, then you consult the durable common, uh, column. If runners were on base, six would be C, D, or F catcher range, which would be if your catcher had C, D, or F. And we'll cover that again. Unable to block the pitch, past ball, runners advance one base. So you got a little bit of cool, you know, a little bit of rare plays, kind of like the old RP charts for uh, APBA football comes to mind because I played that game and I love those RP charts. I love the one where you're running down the field and you fumble the ball and it bounces off the ground and you kicked it through the uprights and your team got three points. <laughs> Drop kicks are still legal in the NFL. All right, I digress. Um, base running rules. Basic base running rules are all runners advance the same number of bases as the hit. So if it is a single, all base runners advance one base. If it is a double, all base runners advance two bases. A triple, it clears the bases. Uh, a runner advancement hit location chart is provided to better visualize the hits and indicate which fielder fields the ball. That would be that chart right there. And in order to obtain, whether for a single or a double, where the ball went to, you roll your D10, five if it's a single, soft blooper into short right or left field. Now any time on this chart that these are separated with a slash, it depends on left-handed, right-handed batter. Uh, left-handed batter hits the ball to the location on the left, right field. Right-handed batter hits it to the location on the right, left field. Um, but we will uh, cover the charts in detail. Exceptions. With two outs or when the hit comes from the batter's wheelhouse, like pitcher wheelhouse, or the hit happens here, wheel. If it happens there, runners get an extra base. Um, do do do. Runners get an extra base. Okay. When the hit result comes from the batter's patient section, the lead runner has the option to advance the same number of bases as the hit and attempt an extra base. Please refer to uh, the runner advancement coach's choice attempt and extra base chart for additional details. That is this one right here. Attempt an extra runner advancement coach's choice, attempt an extra base. Again, we'll go through these as we go. Uh, double play, whenever there's a runner on first and less than two outs, a possible double play has occurred on the ground ball result G1. Right there, G3. G4, G5, or G6. So any of the G's, ground balls, could result in a double play with a runner on first and less than two outs. In order to figure out whether a double play occurred, you roll the 2D6. 
you're going to compare them to, well, let's just for the example say, okay, we'll leave it there. You're going to compare them to both the pitcher's double play rating, which is 10, and the batter's double play rating, which is 8. The higher the number, the more likely a double play will occur. Um, if the 2d6 total is equal to or less than both the batter and pitcher's double play rating, 8 and 10, this is a 7, the batter is grounded into a double play. Batter out, uh, runner from first to second out. If needed, consult the out chart to determine which runner is out. If the 2d6 result is higher than one or both of the double play ratings, so let's say they rolled a nine. It is higher than Gene Richards' eight, lower than Mickey Lolich's 10. Or if they rolled a 12, it is higher than both. Consult the out chart to determine if the runner or batter is out. And the out chart is right here. And you use that same rule to determine. Um, so out, if it was hit to the third baseman and you roll the 12, line out, double play. A and B, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at that. Here, here we go. A and A and B. Everything's right there. I keep forgetting. There's a glossary. So line out, double play, A and B. Fielder makes a great catch of the line drive. If range is A or B, if the fielder's range is A or B, lead runner caught off base for double play. So anything you're not sure of here, it's right there. Defense or out glossary. Anything you're not sure of, it's right there. It tells you whether uh, deep fly or short fly, if base runners are going to advance or not. Everything is right there. Alrighty. Uh, that is double plays. Stealing bases. There are three options for stealing bases. I use option one. Um, option one is each manager is allowed to, and able to attempt a stolen base at any time using the runner's steal letter rating. I really should have a catcher's card on the table or at least visible. There's one. Using the runner's steal rating, which is uh, B. We don't need these anymore. And the catcher's arm rating, which is three. Um, do do do. Use those to determine if a stolen base attempt was successful or not. To use this option, simply announce the intention to steal a base and use percentile die and the stealing charts provided. So you do it just like that. B three on the steal chart. It actually has B3. You roll the percentile dice, 96, get your result for B3, 96, stolen base. Um, it gives you stuff here for stealing third, stealing home. It's got a little glossary here as well, which we'll cover that in depth. That is how you do it with option one. Option two is the auto steal option, and it uses the fast action cards, which I have not cut. I do not use. They're in the bottom of my box with the teams. I can't dig it out to show you, um, but it comes with fast action cards if you don't want to mess with the dice. And as a matter of fact, all of the results are on each fast action card. Um, option three. No, actually, that's an auto steal. Okay, no, that's different. Sorry, auto steal. Let's actually read the rule. Option two, whenever the batter reaches first or second and the next base is open, compare the 2d6 to the batter's steal rating. So he rolls a six, it's a four. If the result is equal to or less than the number listed, the batter will also attempt to steal the next base. So let's say he rolled a four. He's going to auto steal. This is when you don't want to be making the calls. You want the dice probabilities and statistics of how often he actually tried to steal a base to take over. If you want to take yourself out of the decision making process. 
And then you do the batter's steal rating, catcher's arm rating, and use the chart to determine whether he made it or not. Uh, option three is the same as option one. However, the runner must first get a jump to try to steal. Roll all four dice. Compare the two D6 to the pitcher's hold rating. Lolich has a hold of six. We've rolled an eight. If the dice is equal to or less than the hold rating, the runner gets a jump and attempts to steal the next base. Then consult the appropriate stealing chart based on the steal rating, the letter, and the catcher's arm rating, the number. Do, 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 do. If the 2D6 is higher than the hold rating, the runner does not get a jump and does not attempt to steal. The runner may not attempt to steal again until the next batter or after a foul ball result. To attempt to steal third using option three, the 2D6 result must be doubles, and the total must be equal to or less than the pitcher's hold rating. That's why I use option one, because if I'm going to steal third, I just like to steal third. I don't do it often, but I'm going to do it. Uh, resolve the stolen base attempt. Combine the runner's steal letter and the catching arm catcher's arm rating and create the rating that will be used on the stealing chart as we've shown you before regardless of which option is used please refer to the pickoff section of the rules below when the runner does not get a jump and 12 or double sixes are rolled on the d6s so pickoffs no i don't do jumps we will cover it pickoffs if the batter does not get a jump he may be picked off the runner may be picked off on double sixes or rolled on the 2d6. Refer to the included pickoff chart to determine the result of the pickoff attempt. There is a pickoff chart that I have never used right there. And it tells you, um, it tells you how to do it. So there is that, the catcher's arm. Catchers have an arm rating of one through five. Fred Kendall's is a three. One being the best, five being the worst. Outfielder arms, left, center, and right, have an outfield arm rating that ranges from three to ten. Three being the best and ten being the worst. So Richards has a four arm in center field. That's pretty daggone good. He has a six in left field. That's okay. And we will show you where that comes into play, why four is better than six is better than 8, is better than 10. But we'll get to that. All right. Sacrifice bunts. Much like stealing bases, there are different options that may be used. There are two options. Option, And it should be agreed upon before the game for both managers if you're playing with somebody else. Option 1, each manager may de determine when to attempt a sacrifice bunt to do so. He simply says, I'm going to sacrifice bunt. And he rolls 1d6 and the percentile and use the bunters rating and the sacrifice bunt chart to determine the sacrifice bunt attempt result so we're going to roll that he has a sacrifice bunt rating of b he rolls a three and a 92. so we go to the sacrifice bunt chart and he has a b rating he rolled a 92, which is a miss. And if there's a miss, the batter misses the pitch. On the second miss, the batter strikes out. Runners hold. On a suicide squeeze, on one miss, runner is on third is out at home. If he had rolled a 95, there could be an error involved. If he had rolled a 90, it would be a successful sacrifice hit. Um, this would be the lead runner is out. This would be into a double play, and this would be just a pop-out, uh, runner's hold. The D6, a 3, determines which fielder fielded it. And in this instance, 1 or 4 would be the pitcher, 2 or 6 is the catcher, 3 is first base, 5 is third base. There's no 4 or 6, second and short or not, they're generally covering bases. Second is charging over to first to uh, cover that plate. So if you've got the 3 coming up like that, 
it would be a sacrifice if it was an out. Well, if it's a successful sacrifice, it would be from the first baseman fielding it to the second baseman covering first. Basically, kind of thing. That is how you do sacrifice bunts. For option one, option two is the auto sacrifice, where you look at the sacrifice, let's see, um, with a runner on first and or second and less than two outs. Instead of checking the pitcher card, First, check the area on the batter's card under the word Sacrifice, which that's a 12. If the 2d6 total is within range or equal to the number numbers found on the batter's card, the batter attempts to advance the base runners with a bunt, meaning if he rolled a 12, he would automatically bunt. That takes your decision-making out of the process. Some cards have like 4 through 12, which means if he rolled anywhere from a 4 to 12, he'd be bunting. That guy bunts like crazy. Uh, if it was 4 to 5, 4-5, four if you rolled a 4 or a 5, it would be an automatic sacrifice bunt. All righty. And also, you will note there is not a bunt for hit rating. All bunt hit attempts have been incorporated into the player's hitting ratings. This was done for a variety of reasons. Foremost, to streamline gameplay and also to prevent misuse of the bunting for a hit option by removing it completely. If desired, you may replicate the strategy of bunting for a hit by using the batter's run rating. Simply announce the intention to bunt for a hit and roll the 2d6 and 1d10. If the D10 result is 0 through 3, like that, well, if, if the 2, okay, if the D10 is 0 through 3, and the 2 D6 is equal to or less than the batter's run rating, which his run rating is 7, so you rolled that. Do, 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 do. the batter is safe with a bunt single. If the D10 result is 4 through 9, and the, and, or the 2D6 is greater than the run rating of the batter, then the batter is out at first. In either scenario, all runners advance one base. Use the lowest D6 die and sacrifice bunt chart to determine which fielder made the play, first baseman. A player may attempt to bunt for a hit only once per game and never as a pinch hitter. That covers bunting. Ballpark charts. These are confusing as all get out until you get the hang of it and you get someone to point out how to do it. And I'm going to do just that. When the result on the pitcher's card calls for ballpark or defense, you go to the home team's ballpark chart. So let's say we rolled a three. Okay. We rolled a 396. Well, we're going to do ballpark first. So let's say we rolled a 496. Ballpark, you're going to go to this section right on top that says ballpark. This is the ballpark result section on the ballpark card. You go to the ballpark, if it's a left-handed batter, like Gene Richards is, you look at the two D6s. 96, that would be in play, and you're going to use the in play section of his card. If instead that had been perhaps a, a 16, like so, you would look on the left-handed batter side, because Gene Richards is a lefty, and it would be within the 1 to 35, you would use the wheelhouse portion of his card. First left-handed pitcher, of course. And then, after this, you would roll again, so that way you could get the result. So if it was in play, 13, that would be a single. Um, in a wheelhouse, 13 would be a double. So there you go. That's how you do ballpark defense is the tricky one defense 
So let's say we rolled a 3, 13. Defense. The first thing you do is when you come up with defense, you bring up this little chart right here. Defense. You used a percentile that was 13, and you determine if it is a range check or an error check. So 13 is a range check on the third baseman. And let's say the third baseman's range is C. You're going to look at C on the range portion of the ballpark card. You roll all the dice again. You roll a 52. C, 52 is an out. So if it falls in this range, it's out. If it falls in this range, it's a hit. Since it is an out, notice how you have out and the number sign. You go to the out chart. We rolled a 12. It was to the third baseman. Third baseman, 12. Line out, double play, A or B. Well, he was a C range, so it wouldn't be a double play, but it is a line out. That is a type of out. It could have been a ground ball. It could have been a pop out. This tells you what kind of out it is. Let us say that he rolled a 32. That would be a hit, 1 to 43. Hit, exclamation point. On the same chart is the hit. It was hit to the third baseman, it's a 12. It is a double, and all runners advance three bases. It could have been a double, they advance two. It could have been a single, they advance one. A single, they advance two. If it was hit to the second baseman or shortstop, this would be the result. Hit to the outfield, this would be the result. That is how you do a range check. Let's say instead we had rolled... Um, 382. Defense. Go to the defense chart. 82 is an error check on the shortstop. So let's say the shortstop has an error rating of 4. We're going to look along here for the error rating the shortstop has. And 4 is a good one. Error ratings, 5 is the best, 1 is the worst. Range, A is the best, F is the worst. And you can see hit increases as you go, errors increase as you go. So let's say he had a 4 rating and we rolled an 82. That is an out. Falls in this range right here. And again, you go to this chart. We rolled a... Ah, dee da dee da We rolled a 3... To the shortstop would be a ground ball plus ADV. Batter out at first, other runners advance one base. Everything's over here. Let's say instead we had rolled a 22. 1 through 32, that would be an error. There is an error chart on the same card. All the ballpark stuff is right here on the same chart. To the shortstop, we rolled a 3. That would be a one base error. Um, if it had gone to outfield positions, the catcher. So whatever player you determine for the range or error check, you look at their range, R is range, or E is error rating. Then you consult the proper part here, roll the dice again, determine what the result is, and look at the chart and find out exactly how it went down. That is how you do ballpark and defense. Okay, next is hit and run. And there's a hit and run chart. Hit and run is an optional strategy that may be used at any time during a game. When a hit and run is called, and generally you don't want to do it with two outs, you can do it with two outs. You don't want to do it with two outs. Generally, don't do it with two outs. But it does not say that in these rules. So you can do it whenever you want to. When a hit and run is called, the runners will begin, begin running to the next base as soon as the ball is pitched. While the batter attempts to make contact, usually placing the ball in a hole made by the fielders, generally second baseman or shortstop, moving to cover the base the runner is attempting to get to. 
The advantages of hit and run are base runners advancing an extra base on all hits. Example, two bases on a single. And greatly reducing the chance of grounding out of a ground out resulting in a double play. The disadvantages are line out results, the line outs result in a double play. The lead runner having a lower success of stealing the next base if the batter misses the pitch. If the chances of an extra base hit are re, and the chances of an extra base hit are reduced due to the batter swinging to make contact. Okay, the hit and run play can only be used when there is a runner on first or first and second. If you use the hit and run, say you're going to use the hit and run and refer to the chart. So resolve the play normally with the following exceptions. Um, batter's DP rating is four during a hit and run. So if double play comes, if a ground ball happens, then um, his DP is four, and you've got to roll four or less for there to be a double play. All runners advance one extra base on all hits. All lineouts are double plays. If the batter strikes out, the lead runner must attempt to uh, must attempt a stolen base. Use F1 to resolve, regardless of the actual steel arm rating. So you're going all the way over here to F1. You're using this last chart to resolve the steal. And you can see, stolen, 85 to 99. Not a good chance. Um, use F1 to resolve, regardless of the ratings. Use the chart below this. If wheelhouse or patient, wheelhouse or patient is the result. Uh, with the percentile die, 1 through 10, 11 through 30, 31 through 54, 55 to 90, 91, 99. It's right here on the chart. If it is defense, ballpark, in play, tough, you use the batter's card. If it is wheelhouse or patient, you use this chart right here. That is hit and run. Wild pitches. Most batters have a wild pitch rating starting at 30. Mickey Lolich has one that is 30. This is the rule I have the most difficulty with. I never do this because I cannot remember to do it. The game is going. I can never remember to check for wild pitch. When the percentile die yield a result of 30 to 39 on the initial roll, near, 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 and um, initial roll of the dice each at bat, and there are runners on base. Check the percentile dice against the pitcher's wild pitch rating. If the dice result is within the range indicated, the wild pitch has occurred and all runners advance an extra base. So if that had been a 30 and there was a man on first, wild pitch, runner on first goes to second. Uh, 34, because it's in the 30s and there's a man on first, there's no wild pitch. Um, it has not occurred. Runners hold. In both cases, resolve the bat at bat normally with this same dice roll. You use this to resolve the at bat. I can never do that. Uh, why? I don't know. I've got this great big sign that I put over there, and I can't find it. But it's got a great big three zero written. Now here it is. I put this in front of me. Three zero, dummy. Thirties. Check for a wild pitch. I have not done it once, except when it came in on a rare play, and I had to do it because it was part of the rare play. I. That's one rule I cannot wrap myself around. Why I don't know. I just cannot do it. It's a tough one for me. Pitcher stamina. We're just about to the end of the rule book, then we're going to go through the charts, and then that'll be just about it. Pitcher stamina. Every pitcher that started the game receives a start stamina rating number between 5 and 9. Mickey Lolich's is 5. The number is the inning that the pitcher may begin to tire. Once the pitcher reaches that inning, in this case the fifth inning, Da, 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 da. He is considered tire if he has allowed three or more runs to that point. If he has not allowed three or more runs to that point, then he may continue to pitch with his normal ratings until either the game ends or he has allowed three or more runs. We're going to move this over here for a moment. 
Okay, boomity, boomity, boom, boom, boom. Now, beginning in the fifth inning, if Lolich has allowed two or less runs, he may continue to pitch at full strength with no adjustments. If in the fifth inning or later, once Lolich has allowed three or more runs to score, he is to be considered fatigued or tired. Once fatigued or tired, the appropriate fatigue pitcher's card should be placed on top of the pitcher's card. And in this case, and they've got a few of them, it tells you what ERA, ERA range to use and strikeouts per nine innings range to use, which the ERA is listed right here. Strikeouts per nine innings is right there, 3.7. This is placed on top of it. This is the new pitcher card for Mickey Lolich if he's given up three runs with two outs in the fifth inning. Or if he's given up three runs and it comes to the fifth inning when he's pitching. And then this card is used instead. Um, as far, And he's got a greater wild pitch rating, 30 to 31 now. Um, injury, use the same as on his original one. Double play rating, use the same as on his original one. Fatigue, well, he's fatigued. Uh, fielding is now D3 instead of C3. So his fielding is not quite as good. He's going to give up more hits if he's got a field. Um, batting, same as on his regular card. So that is what happens if he is allowed to give up too many runs. Anytime a pitcher allows six or more runs, he is considered fatigued and should use the appropriate fatigued pitcher's card. Even if the pitcher allows six runs in the first inning, he should use the fatigued pitcher's card for as long as he remains in the game after that point. Relief stamina will either be short or long. Da, da, da. These ratings have more to do with how long and how often they should pitch. A short relief pitcher becomes fatigued after pitching two innings or after allowing two runs. A long relief pitcher becomes fatigued after pitching three innings or after allowing three runs at any point. He allows three runs before a single out transpires, he's fatigued. Uh, short relief, he allows two runs after a single out transpires, he's fatigued. And then you use the fatigued pitcher's card. Uh, to determine a reliever fatigue count, each inning the pitcher appears in as one inning, regardless of the number of outs recorded or batter's face. So if he comes in with two outs, Mickey Lolich comes in with two outs in the bottom of the fifth for long relief, and he pitches, faces one batter and gets a ground out. That counts as one inning towards his long. And long relief pitchers become fatigued after pitching three innings, after three innings, or after allowing three runs. And if it was short, it would be after two innings or two runs. So even if he only faces one batter at the end of an inning, that counts as his first inning of relief. Do -de do -de do -de do -de do Certain pitchers have a number or cross symbol behind their rating. He does not. However, some do have a number symbol or a cross symbol right here. When these pitchers are in a save situation, loosely defined as pitching in the ninth inning when their team has a lead of one, two, or three runs, they do not become fatigued as noted until the game, uh, as noted above, until the game becomes tied or their opponent takes the lead. Only when the game is tied or the opponent takes the lead would the above fatigue rules reply for that relief pitcher. Again, uh, in general, a short relief pitcher should pitch zero to two innings, while a long relief pitcher should pitch one to three innings per game. Please refer to the pitcher's rest chart on the bottom of the rare play chart for suggested usage of pitchers. So if you're running a season, it'll tell you how long a pitcher needs to rest after each one, after each appearance. Supplemental strikeout rule. Some pitchers have a supplemental strikeout rating, which would be here if Mickey Lolich had one, either starting with a 50 or a 90, depending on the season set. For those pitchers, whenever a batter makes an out and the percentile die result falls in their strikeout range, record a strikeout instead of using 
the out listed on the batter's card. It's an optional rule to fine-tune the strikeout stats for some pitchers and may be ignored if desired. So we go to page 12, the last page, player usage. Uh, since players are rated exactly as they performed, it's necessary to use players in the same manner as they were in real life. Every player card includes the player's statistics for the season with the batter cards, including a breakdown of at-bats versus lefties and righties. While there's nothing stopping you from playing the highest rated players of uh, all the time, doing so may have an adverse effect on game results if you're going for accuracy, for historical accuracy. Non-carded pitchers and fringe players. Um, certain seasons include roster sheets and lists with the list of players carded in each set. Some of these roster sheets will include, this is stuff you can read later. That's on page 12, the last page of the instruction book. So we've gone through the instruction book. We have shown you, at 45 minutes, so this won't take much longer for the charts. We've shown you how to read and what everything means on the pitcher's card and on the batter's card. We've shown you defensive things, uh, double play ratings, steal ratings, run base running ratings, sacrifice ranges, sacrifice bunt, We've shown you all of that ballpark, um, how to do um, defense, uh, ballpark checks or defense checks. Remember, defense checks, if it says defense, oh, I'll get this out. The first place you go is to the chart and read the percentile. Then you roll all four dice again. Then you go to range or error, range or error, go underneath whatever qualifier you have for the position you chose, decide that, and then go to the hit, error, or out chart to determine the result. So you go from defense, defense chart, range or error check, out, error, or hit. That's the order. That's what you do. Let's move these guys out of the way because we don't need these cards anymore. We're looking at the charts. We've gone over most of the charts to this point. But I want you to see where everything is and how they're laid out. It's actually pretty intuitive. Um, for a certain type of event, you're going to pretty much the same card. Um, one we really haven't touched on much is this dice chart right here. It has ground outs, fly outs, infield in, it has pop outs, it has the bunt for hit rule, and it's got sacrifice bunts. We've gone over that, we've gone over that. Uh, infield in, it tells you how to do infield in. On a ground out result, refer to fly, put out, uh, pop out or line out for other outs. Um, use below on a ground out. So if the infield is in, if it's a ground out result like a G5 or a G3, you use this right down here with the two D6s. Anytime it's a fly out, pop out, or line out, you're going to use that off the cards for the other outs. Um, anytime there's a ground out, it gives you the rundown here on the run rating, uh, the double play. It, Tells you if a runner on third can score, a runner on second can advance to third. If it's hit to second or first, it gives you the whole rundown on how to resolve ground outs with base runners. If it's a fly out, it tells you what runners hold, what runners advance, depending on what type of at bat it was. Wheelhouse, patient, tough, or in play. Um, for pop outs, um, P is a pop out, includes foul balls caught for an out, batters out, runners hold. Uh, L4 and L6, line out, batters out, runners hold. If hit and run play, closest runner caught off base and is out, double play. If in field in, line drive gets past fielder for a single, runners advance a base. So basically all of your uh, defensive explanations are here and also infield in, and also bunting. That is on this one chart. The second chart, which is used with the ballpark card, everything with a ballpark card is used right here. You have your hit, like uh, show the ballpark card again. It has hit exclamation point, 
hit exclamation point. Error, asterisk, error, asterisk. Out, number sign, out, or pound rather, out, pound. And it tells you uh, your total of the two D6 and to which defensive position it was hit and it gives you the result for all three hits, errors, and outs. Uh, of course, your defense um, role for a range or an error check and corresponding horizontally which position it is. Uh, you got your glossaries. When in doubt, look over here. It tells you what it is. There's also a defense rare play chart. Use this chart whenever zero zero is rolled when checking for an error or a range play. So if you roll double zeros looking for this result, use your two D6s and this is what you get. Some cool stuff there as well. That is the second chart. The third chart. You have runner advancement. Um, runner advancement, this is where if uh, you have a base hit, and you want to know which fielder to determine whether a base runner can advance an extra base. You roll, if it's a single, opposite field liner to left or right. Left-handed batter, use the location on the left. So left-handed batter, opposite field to left field. Right-handed batter, opposite field to right field. If it's a double, line drive into the alley center field. Center fielder will be the one that you would be using his arm check to see if you can run. Uh, runner advancement coach's choice. It tells you how to do it here. Roll the two D6s. Compare them to the lead runner's run and the fielder's arm ratings. If the total is equal to or less than both, the runner is safe. If it's greater than both, the runner is out. Other runners advance a base. If the total is greater than one, let's say you have an outfield arm of... Let's get them back out real quick. Let's get that we've got an example we can show you so gene richards is the outfielder fred kendall is the batter if the total is greater than one rating and equal or less than the other his arm rating is four his run rating is seven so let's say he rolled a five then roll the two d10 and refer to the chart below drop out wild throw or safe and it will tell you over here what these mean. So this is another glossary. This is anytime you have coach's choice or an ex attempting an extra base, this is what you do right here. If the 2D10 is double zeros, roll 1D6. 1 to 3, runner out, check runner for injury. 4 to 6, runner safe, check fielder for injury. So this is where some injuries can occur. If you roll double zeros, someone can get hurt. So one in a hundred on a runner advance play. So that's one in a thousand. Someone's going to get hurt. It doesn't happen often, but it can happen right here. Got your stealing chart. You take your base runner's steal rating, which is B, and your catcher's arm rating, which is 3, B3. You look at this, you roll the percentile, you get your result gives you stealing home you've got your hit and run you've got your pickoff you've got personality walk with personality uh, rare play chart base is empty 2d6 runners on base 2d6 this is if you roll double zeros your injury chart your pitcher rest chart and ladies and gentlemen we have just gone through the rules for payoff pitch baseball. You've seen me play some games. Um, I'll probably do an in-depth playthrough at some point in the near future, but we have gone through the rules for payoff pitch. I hope it is clear as mud. Any questions, comment down below. Please, I encourage you, go to Sideline Strategy Games. Joe Bryan has put this game together. It is fantastic. It is awesome. I highly recommend it. Uh, the forums are at forums.delphiforums.com slash sideline games. Check it out, guys. It's a fantastic game. I enjoy it. It's right up there with Strat. I think Strat will always be my favorite. But, man, Payoff Pitch is fantastic. It's a great game. Check it out. Um, again, this is Chris, Stratomatic Delaware. And I don't have the logo anywhere. That's okay. 
Payoff Pitch Baseball. Guys, have a wonderful evening. Take care.